represents the URC in the joint public issues team? Yes. So that works ecumenically to um, engage with issues in society. So Simeon, if you want to <coughs> lead us and say anything else about <coughs> JPEG, if you want to. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I, as Leonora said, work for the URC. Um, I, I took up my role in January um, of this year. I don't know about you, when in the early days in a new job, um, you kind of say yes to everything, don't you? Just because you want to um, experience things and you don't yet know the things that you shouldn't be saying yes to. Um, and that's how I find myself standing here in front of you <laughs> this morning. <laughs> um, because Michael invited me to... Uh, to no. I couldn't say no at that point. Yeah, I'll know better next time. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it is good to be here. It is good to be here and to be sharing with you a little about... Um, the Joint Public Issues team and how, um, as, a, as a team, um, we've responded to particularly the referendum, but also some of those bigger themes around uh, borders and belonging as well. Given that background, um, that I wasn't working for the Joint Public Issues team at the time of the Brexit referendum, um, uh, I, I'm sharing other people's work. Um, so I take no credit, but also I'm not accepting blame either. OK, <laughs> so I want to make that clear as well. So the Joint Public Issues Team, some of you will be very familiar with it, others may not. Um, it is a group of um, a dozen staff from four churches, employed by four churches, uh, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, uh, the United Reformed Church and the Church of Scotland. Uh, and those churches took a decision, um, in the case of three of them in, uh, back in 2006, um, to pool resources um, in terms of uh, the church staff with responsibility for engaging with the world of politics, with issues in public policy, uh, with uh, advocacy for, for on matters of justice and peace. So we work together as an ecumenical team on, beho on behalf of our four churches now, uh, across a whole range of areas, a whole range of issues, but particularly with that focus on engaging with the world of politics and engaging with public policy. Our purpose um, as a team is defined in this way. We'll help our churches to work together in living out the gospel of Christ in the church and in society. We'll promote equality and justice by influencing, influencing those in power and by energizing and affirming local congregations. So in a, w in a way, uh, our work is, is faces in two directions. One is as a voice to the, those in power to the government, to decision makers, and the other is a, a reflection into our churches, helping people within our churches to engage with some of the issues that we <laughs> face in society, engage in the democratic process as well. We're a resource to churches, we're a voice to government. And the interplay and the occasional tension between those two facets of our work played out in the way that JPIT responded to the referendum, as we shall see. Uh, as a team, we have a long history of providing resources to help churches and to help church members engage in the democratic process. In fact, some churches only think about JPIT when it comes to election times, because we provide guides on holding hustings, gathering your parliamentary candidates, doing that in a fair way, a way that uh, generates light and, and, and helps people to make informed decisions in the democratic process. We provide guides, briefings for issues that you might want to think about as you think about uh, how to vote. We provide prayers for churches to use at that time and recognising that our churches include members of all different political persuasions uh, and also our status as, as registered charities, these resources, these guides are all non-partisan. But they're not neutral. They're not completely neutral. We would take the side of the vulnerable. We would take the side of justice and of peace. And so there will be arguments and, uh, for, for the issues that we think people should be bearing in mind, but we wouldn't tell people how to vote. And those guides would connect with our ongoing work, the work that happens between elections, um, such as advocacy on issues of, of welfare reform, for instance, on in the environment, on peacemaking 
where we would try to bring a distinctively Christian voice into those debates rooted in the values of God's kingdom. So the arrival of the, the referendum created something of a dilemma for our member churches and therefore for JPIT. Do we treat this like an election? Do we provide, we don't take sides, we try and resource people to engage? <coughs> or do we take a stance? Do we choose to be more prophetic, more outspoken? One of our member churches, the Church of Scotland, um, took a side. It backed Remain. It was based on a long-standing commitment to Europe expressed in the decisions of the Church of Scotland's General Assembly. We might hear more about that tomorrow. And also, as it, as it happens, that reflected the majority view of people in Scotland. So that, that was the Church of Scotland's approach. But the other three denominations, including the United Reformed Church, didn't take a side in the referendum. They didn't have a mandate to do so, partly because it wasn't a subject that the church decision-making bodies had actually spent time discussing. And we might want to consider why that was the case and uh, reflect on that going back. And I think there are still some debates going on, some reflection going on as to whether that was the right decision. But it was the way that things were. And so JPIT, as a team reflecting those four different churches, produced a set of very balanced resources. Uh, good resources, think, pray, vote. They helped, the intention was that they would help Christians to consider Britain's membership of the European Union in the light of the gospel, to command to, uh, the gospel, sorry, the gospel command to love your neighbour. They didn't presume to tell people which way they should vote, but they explored the issues surrounding different aspects of membership of the European Union. And they offered different opinions, different perspectives. There were seven particular issues that are highlighted in these resources. The single market, sovereignty and subsidiarity, <coughs> free movement, work and benefits, peace and international relations, care for the environment, and agriculture and food. <coughs> All crucial questions about how the UK would relate to the EU now and in the future. And it provided churches with reflections and scripture passages and a series of questions in relation to each <coughs> issue. It opened up perspectives, but it didn't say to people, this is what we think you should think. But it did include the personal perspectives of two people one arguing for remain, one arguing for leave. And it offered background practical information on the EU. So it was there to inform, to open up, but not to guide people into a particular decision. When the result of the referendum came in, and let's remember what a surprise that result was to many, many people, each of our member churches had to consider quite rapidly what their response was going to be. And a series of <coughs> statements were issued in the names of the leaders of the different denominations. Resolutions were passed at the Methodist Conference and at the United Reformed Church General Assembly, which happened within a few weeks of the referendum uh, result. I was trying to make sense of what those statements said, and I was synthesizing them the other day. I pasted them into Wordle. Do you know Wordle? This uh, clever tool of, you know, picks up all the words and uh, makes bigger the ones that occur most often. I'm not sure it helps us very much in see, <laughs> seeing what, what the themes were. So I, I, I tried a different kind of analysis. Um, these were the things that I picked up uh, on those, uh, from those uh, initial church responses to the referendum. They were essentially pastoral responses rather than prophetic ones. They recognised the range of responses that people might be feeling to the result. They all, in one way or another, accepted the result, acknowledged the result, said the people have made their decision, we must live with it, in words to that effect. They also reminded people of the bigger picture be that the values of the kingdom, 
our commitments to the common good, the constancy of God's love. So set the result in that, in that bigger picture. They also urged reconciliation, coming together after the divisions of the campaign and the church's role in bringing about some of that healing of being a, an inclusive community. They affirmed relationships with individuals and with institutions in Europe, particularly the church's relationships in that sense. They called on people to resist hatred, to resist racism, to resist that heightened rhetoric um, that had been very evident during the campaign. In the case of the URC, um, it also in included an explicit statement of standing in solidarity with European nationals living in the UK, which I know that many people found very valuable. And they encouraged prayer. Prayer for the country and prayer particularly for those in authority as they went through this process that everyone knew was going to be a difficult process. There were some fine words expressed, some, some fine sentiments, and maybe um, some of you were involved in crafting similar statements in response to the, to the referendum or in reading them or in sharing them. Some of them were very widely shared. Um, the Methodist Conference when it agreed its statement, said every Methodist church should read this on the Sunday after it was agreed. And it was read in all the churches. I'm a Methodist local preacher and I had to stand in a pulpit and read this out. And we put it on a signboard outside our church and it stayed there for several weeks. And actually it was felt to be a significant response at that time. But then came the question of what do we actually do next? We can say things, but what do we actually do next. And as analysis was undertaken of the referendum vote, it became clear that the churches were as divided on Brexit as the rest of society. And I know there are various bits of analysis that have been done on this and we're seeing some of them, uh, uh, we've seen some, heard about some already and we're going to hear some later as well. And they're all slightly different, but essentially they show a very similar picture that our churches are pretty divided pretty evenly divided uh, in, the form, in the case of, um, of the non-conformist denominations between the Leave and the Remain uh, sides, um, apart from in Scotland. So there were two strands to um, J. Pitt's longer term response to the referendum result. One was about having constructive conversations and the other was about focusing on the things that matter coming out of this. And this, the rest of my presentation will look at each of those in turn. Conversations first. One of the questions that was posed in the wake of the decision to leave the EU was whether the quality of debate and conversation suffered along the way. So much coverage in the media was reduced to the trading of insults, disparaging of opponents, perpetuating misinformation and exaggeration. It's quite hard to dial that down again once it's been released. And when that begins to happen, people can feel uneasy about engaging with those who might feel differently from themselves. Or well, they might struggle to find the words to challenge the narratives and the assumptions that emerge from both sides. So JPIT put together um, a resource to help churches and to help community groups provide a setting where informed, reasonable debate could take place about some of the issues that were prompted by the referendum. And it was called Conversation Welcome. Uh, I've got a copy here and it's available on our website. I'll show you the address in a minute. My colleague David produced a little video to introduce it, so uh, I'm going to try and show that now. Thank you. So as, as David explains there, we wanted to create some safe spaces where people could acknowledge their differences, learn from each other's points of view, and not simply pigeonhole each other as being utterly divided 
and in conflict. We know that without healthy conversations, differences can quickly become divisions that damage and that undermine our sense of community. And as we as was mentioned in the film, there were four particular big questions that Conversation Welcome sought to open up. What sort of society do we want for future generations? How should we treat others? How should we use our resources? And how should we make decisions? And there were extensive materials for holding conversations. There were video starting points, but also scriptural Bible study starting points, um, as well as a guide to holding good conversations. And it's available on the Joint Public Issues website if you're interested in getting a hold of a copy. And I think it's still um, relevant today. So how has that gone down? In reality, it's been quite disappointing how it's gone down. Um, we've had some positive feedback from some groups and some churches that have engaged with it and used it. Maybe some people here have. Um, but the take up has been very low. And one of the things we've been reflecting on is why that is the case. And I, I think it's partly people aren't ready to have some of those conversations yet. People were not ready to acknowledge their differences and not ready to move on from the referendum result. Um, and also, I think some churches were fearful that in having a conversation like this, they would actually open up divisions. And I suppose there's a judgment to be made about whether that's a helpful thing or not. And we might want to discuss that in a little while. Anyway, so that was one offering that the Joint Public Issues team made into this situation. Um, the second major part of, of J. Pitt's response to the, the Brexit result was to think about how that affected the rest of our work as a team, the rest of our priorities as a team. Uh, one Conservative MP um, recently described Brexit as being like a landslip, because nothing is quite where it was before. Things have been revealed that were previously hidden. And no one's quite sure what happens next or how we get there. And I think that's quite an apt um, analogy uh, for the way that things uh, feel post-Brexit. So after consulting within our churches, um, JPIT refocused its work around six hopes, six hopes for a post-Brexit world. I suppose that makes an assumption that we were going to get to a post-Brexit world, and there's still a question about whether that will ever arrive. Um, some of us hope we might not ever get to a post-Brexit world. But this was six hopes, six things that would be important, regardless of how this process goes. Six things that really mattered, that were real priorities. And they were framed around, around um, gospel hopes. The first was around a society that welcomed a stranger, the hope being a more welcoming atmosphere in the UK for migrants, for refugees, for asylum seekers, for European nationals, for anyone who comes to this country seeking welcome. And so that led us into a focus on work uh, around challenging the hostile environment, which caught up the, some members of the Windrush generation, but many, many others. Uh, work around what happens in our um, post-Brexit immigration system and what are the priorities within that? Is it just about valuing people who do a certain kind of well-paid work or are, are there other things that should be reflected in that system too? And is it an opportunity to change some of those things that the churches have had long-standing concerns about, such as the, the treatment of, refu of uh, family members of refugees um, uh, and the detention system um, uh, and, and holding people um, without limit uh, in detention centres. So that's one focus um, for, for us. The second was around poverty and a society where the poorest are at the centre, the hope being for a more economically just society where power and resources were redistributed. This built on a long-standing work of, of JPIT around challenging the stigmatisation of those in poverty and seeking a welfare system that was fairer and that was more generous. Um, to those who are most vulnerable. It also uh, made itself known uh, in, in um, some of our policy work around, poli uh, around uh, um, uh, poverty-proofing Brexit. So our European um, uh, membership um, 
brings additional resources for some parts of the country which are particularly um, uh, poorly off economically? How do we ensure that those things are maintained uh, as we go through the process of leaving the EU? Um, so the, the idea of a poverty-proof Brexit um, came to the fore. The third of our post-Brexit hopes was around a society which valued each generation, where each generation enabled the flourishing of the other. And this was particularly thinking about some of the divisions between the generations that the Brexit vote had revealed. You know, the, uh, if you're under 40, you essentially were much more likely to vote remain. And if you were over um, 60, then you were much more likely to vote leave. A huge difference in society's uh, approaches depending on your age. And actually, there are a number of areas where our society is quite, uh, uh, there's some quite stark inequalities in, in our society uh, between the generations, also about the distribution of welfare and the, um, uh, the benefits of public services. Uh, and being aware that the millennial generation, the first generation in 100 years, to have less good prospects than their parents. That's creating an uh, opening up a new division in society that we ought to be conscious of and, and seeking to address. And that's an area where we're just really beginning our work. And the fourth area was around the environment and uh, a world which shares a single planet fairly, seeking to distribute resources um, fairly across the world, but also across generations yeah. when we think of, of our carbon budgets as well. The fifth was around peacemaking, and cl clearly the, one of the, the great strengths of the European Union has been as a, as a vehicle for, for nurturing peace within the continent of Europe. That continues to be an important thing to be part of, um, and ac active uh, engagement in, in countering violence and in building peace, uh, and in arguing, for instance, for a nuclear-free uh, world. And the final hope um, that we work around is a society where there is greater de democratic participation. Because although there were large numbers engaged in the, in the democratic uh, event that was the referendum, there were still quite a number that were not, and there are particular groups that are disenfranchised, that are not engaging in democracy. So let's do some work uh, as churches to try and reach out um, and ensure that, that people who have, whose voices are not generally heard um, are more widely heard. Uh, in, in different ways uh, of democratic in engagement, um, <laughs> including an initiative to encourage people to churches to build relationships with their local MPs so that MPs get to understand something about what local churches are about. So that's, that's how we think about our work now. Two main responses, conversation welcome and focusing our work around these six post-Brexit hopes. But it would feel wrong to stand here in front of you and say that I think we've got the answers and to th think that we've got our response to, to Brexit right. Um, in truth, we really struggle. We've really struggled to know what to do and what to say. My colleagues who've been there throughout the process would acknowledge that and would say it's really difficult because we act on behalf of churches which are divided and which take different views. And so it's, it's very hard um, for, for, for us uh, to know exactly what we can and should be saying and doing. Um, this perhaps one is, isn't one for the uh, for kind of public broadcast, uh, um, Kevin. But I, I, in part, I suspect that is um, uh, because we're a church.